Hi, this is Brett the Hitman Hart, and I want to introduce you to some of my great memories of Calgary. Well, Scotsman's Hill is a, is a good place for me where I have a lot of memories, you know. brings back uh, a lot of memories of my old Stampede wrestling days. You know, I used to live, have a little house down here on uh, 18th Avenue uh, in Ramsey. A little uh, dumpy house that's probably done everyone a big favor by being torn down now. But uh, it was home for me, and uh, this neighborhood was kind of home. I did a lot of, I used to run, when I used to get ready for my trips to Japan where I wrestled and stuff like that. I'd have to get in shape, so I remember running up Scotsman's Hill and running all the way down and all the way down by past up by the zoo and then running back and running back to my house. But uh, brings back a lot of memories. I can remember lugging my bag all the way up the hill. It'd be about 90 degrees and I'd be sweating and I'd drag my bag and I'd go down the those exact steps over there and go through the gate with a little pass and uh, walk through the uh, fairgrounds with all the fans or you know just Calgarians in general patting you on the back and wishing you luck in your world title match with Hardy Race or Nick Bockwinkel or guys I fought um, back then. But I remember uh, a lot of good memories up here just my own special ones parking here with uh, probably my first wife, my second wife and my the third one, stopping here and telling stories about you know things I did back a long time ago. But it, it's always been a place for me. It's got a great, got a great view of the city, and you see how much uh, everything's changed out here since then. And it's uh, to me, it has always been a good historical place in Calgary to go. Okay, well this here is probably one of the most. Um, for me, like I got more flashbacks of childhood memories than maybe next to my dad's house. This would be the place. They try to sell the programs to the guys that came around the corner. They would come around the corner from parking their car way down there, probably where the dome is. They'd park. And so you wanted to be first. You know, selling that program before my little brother, who was a little cuter than I was, so he was gonna, you know, he's gonna take advantage of who they're gonna always buy from the cuter little brother all the time. So you had to get out away from him and you had to wait for the fans to come in from all these directions. A lot of fans back then, they would come over from the big four building over there. They get all sauced up and uh, take in the wrestling. It was like a good way to have a few brews and then uh, take in the show. And I would uh, sell them programs out here. Make my first money, made my first cash as in, in making a living in wrestling was selling programs when I was six years old maybe even five and as far as I know selling programs over at the corral I believe I sold 1500 programs by myself and I think it was a record amongst program sellers I don't think anybody ever topped that 1500 was a lot of programs but I remember pushing some guy's head through this window right here it was a different kind of door but I still got the scars on my fingers from running the guy's head through the through the door here. <laughs> Luckily, um, I didn't get hurt too bad. I didn't cut any nerves, thank God. But And I don't think the guy got hurt too bad. I think I ended up hurting my hand more than he did. But um, there was one thing about uh, working this front door with my brother Wayne. I got tough fast. Like I wasn't a street fighter or a tough guy so much. But when I was um, 16 or 17, I was city and provincial wrestling champion. I was getting bigger and tougher and stronger and I learned fast how to get street fight tough on the on the door here with my brother Wayne who was a pretty handy uh, fighter himself and you know we fought a lot of a lot of drunks and a lot of fans that got keyed up watching the wrestling and you know I'd say I learned how to be a man in this place right here. When they asked me to do this, um, go find places where I have specific childhood memories, this is for sure uh, right here in the alley, you know, is one of the defining. And this school, you know, I mean, I this is where I probably formed myself more, more than anywhere else. Uh, this is where I uh, sort of set the markers for where I was going to go later in my life. And uh, it all starts right here. 
but I had come to school and he was a grade uh, bigger than I was and I was a kid named Brett McFarland and uh, he challenged me to a fight in, in the alley at uh, right after school right here and actually this was grass I think here somebody had a yard here I learned so much at that time about promotion it was a sellout crowd there was every kid in every grade was here like it was this whole street was filled with kids and they were all waiting for me to come out. I had thought about it all day. I said, this is what I'm going to do. I know I can't box to save my life. You know, I really couldn't box, but I, I said, I'm going to pretend I'm going to box. I'm going to start throwing really high punches and make him get his arms up. So I kept swinging at him real high and everyone thought it was like, they all thought it was like crazy to throw pu high punches, but it made him lift his arms up. And then as soon as he lifted his arms up, I shot like a double leg takedown and took him right down by the legs. Took him down. He was bigger than I was. Took him down, got on his, got on top of him, and I remember putting him in a sleeper hold. A uh, full-on sleeper hold, right cranked on full blast, and I was choking him right out. And I remember some kid from Ernest Manning decides he's the referee or something, and he goes, it's a choke hold. And I go, there's no rules in a street fight, like in a school fight, you know. He goes, you got to break it up. And I go, why? I don't have to break it up. And he goes, you got to break it up. And he made me break it up, and I remember going, who's this guy? Somebody, somebody made him suddenly a referee, you know. And so he made me break it up, but I remember that kid that I had in the sleeper hold, that Brett McFarland, he was already beat. He, he was already, he was in serious trouble. And I remember he stood up, and he, we were going to fight, keep fighting. I did the exact same thing. I tended to throw high punches and he got his arms up again and then I shot a double leg on him and took him down again. And it was all very, um, it was pretty cool for me back then because everyone thought I was going to get wiped. I was not supposed to win this fight. Anyway, I took him down the second time and I just beat the crap out of him somewhere around here. Just remember I punched him and punched him and punched him and until he gave up twice. I made sure he gave up twice. Like I didn't hear, I remember I said, I can't hear you. Say it louder. And he, I give, I give. And he, and I jumped up and it was just like wrestling. And I talk about it in uh, one of my wrestling DVDs about how I got picked up by all my grade eight, because it was basically the grade eight scenes to grade nines. And I got picked up by all my school friends. And they had me on their shoulders and they were carrying me all around the streets here. And I can remember when I, um, when they were holding me up on their shoulders, I could see the kid that lost. I can remember he ran right down the sidewalk and ran down that street. And he just ran with, nobody, nobody went with him. He went all by himself. And I felt kind of a pang of sadness for him, but he asked for it. <laughs> you know, he, he wanted the fight. He picked the fight. He started all this stuff with me. I never even bothered him. So he kind of got what he had coming. He wanted a fight, he got a fight. But for me, it was, um, that was a big turning point in my life. I mean, I really stood up for something and uh, had a lot at stake, family, reputation, uh, my name, things I did in high school as a wrestler, all sort of formulated out of that uh, time period. This is the first house I ever bought. I bought it when I was about, I don't know, 20 years old. Paid 48000 for it. Um, I had to get a running start to make it from the front door to the kitchen because the floors were all slanted and whoever did the house up did it with the, the cheapest and ugliest uh, wallpaper and stuff like that that he could find. And, uh, but my brother Smith assured me that it was, uh, it was a good investment and a fixer-upper that I could sell and double my money on, but, which uh, I should have never listened to him. Uh, I ended up selling it years later. After about, I don't know, seven or eight years, I sold it for twenty-eight thousand. On a, took a big hit on it, but uh, I learned my lesson. But as far as the memories, I mean, I have a lot of memories. I can actually remember probably about 1981, like one of these houses. Actually, that one right up there. It was on fire. The whole house was on fire, and I was the first one on the scene. I tried to kick in the doors. I had. It was a weather about like this now, and then I had flip-flops on because I'd just come back from uh, New Zealand. And I tried to kick in the door with flip-flops. I ended up saving a Korean family that all came out of the top roof of the house, and 
unfortunately there's a family or not family a couple of guys that lived in the bottom uh, and one of them one of them died with his girlfriend in the fire I think she's the one that fell asleep with a cigarette and uh, but I remember the fire trucks pulling up while I was trying to rescue everybody and they kicked in the doors you know I did what I could anyway that day the guy that bought this house after me kept it like it was for a long time but I didn't see he's finally done a serious upgrade and it's uh, I'm glad for him I hope it's uh it's a good house, but for me, I used to always hum that song about the Jeffersons, about moving on up, because I did. This is probably, for me, the, the king of king of all uh, sort of birthplace of memories for me. I mean, this is, doesn't get any better than, I mean, my whole childhood is here. You know, when I look at that house, that top floor on the, not the top, top, but the, on the balcony there, that second floor, that was where my mom, my mom and dad's bedroom was on the right there. And down on the left, the, the, the windows in the middle on the second floor, that was my mom and dad's office. That was all filing cabinets and telephones and that's where the wrestling world, you know, just, just lit up in that room. And then the very next room on the other side of the wall is the bedroom that I grew up in with five boys. Uh, we were all in there, my brother Dean, my brother Ross, Owen, and I think Wayne was in there for a long time. If my mom and dad could have seen me that night, they, my dad would have pulled my head off. But I, you know, I took it to my sisters and my brother and a bunch of them that night. It was kind of like, uh, Custer's last stand in there. You know, I think I recall even like almost like swinging off the chandeliers into a pile of my sisters. And, you know, I remember after it was done, it was like a weasel in the hen house. I was really guilty of uh, roughing them all up and taught them all a serious lesson. They were all crying and waiting for my dad to come home. My mom and dad went to some party that I guess they, they just, they didn't get home till about three in the morning, but I remember they all waited up it was past midnight, they're all sitting in the kitchen with their arms crossed, waiting to tell on me for my poor conduct. And uh, I remember knowing when I went to bed, like, uh oh, I'm in some serious shit. My dad's gonna kill me when he finds out that, you know. And they're all witnesses to each other, they're all backing up each other. And I can remember it was about three in the morning, my dad and my mom came home, they were just wiped. And as soon as the door opened in the kitchen and they came in and my sisters right away were crying and my brother was there and he's crying and he was so bad and he was like then and I remember hearing this whole thing I remember my mom going Stu you got to do something about it and I remember he was just so tired and I remember he came all the way upstairs I could hear him coming I could hear the shuffle of his feet coming down the hall on the carpet and I remember like oh my god here it comes I'm going to pay for it this time because I knew I was a bad dog that night and I remember he came in and he stood over my bed <laughs> and he looked at me and he goes Buster don't let it happen again and he turned around and walked out and I was like yes and, like, and I remember my sisters are going that's it and that's all he gets and they were crying and it was like get to bed and all that he wouldn't hear any more about it and it was just he was too tired to make anything of it <laughs>